creating the antagonist together, creating a world together is one of those tools, but um, giving someone a specific set of mechanics is another thing that activates the human brain in a certain way. I'm speaking to the RPG designer, Paul Sega. Paul, hello. Hello. Uh, would you be able to introduce yourself in your own words? Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm Paul Sega. Uh, I design role-playing games and storytelling games. Uh, I've been doing it since, well, I mean, in a, you know, and actually publishing them since 2003. Uh, if you've heard of me, um, it's probably from my game, My Life with Master, which uh, created a lot of conversation at the time that I published it because it, um, it's, it takes the end of play as a creative destination, which was not particularly common at the time. Uh, it won the Diana Jones Award in 2004. Um, and, uh, you know, in our conversation, I'm sure we'll talk about some of my other games as well. The Clay That Woke, I think, might come up yep. um, since we're talking about uh, world building. So, I mean, I know that we have sort of spoken in, in Twitter DMs about, like, Ian Cheng's work um, with his book. But given the term world runner, I guess we should start at the beginning and maybe just explore for a little while what is a world and what does it mean to you? Yeah. Um, so I, I think, um, you know, I, I, I think it's easy, uh, to, to think that as a creator, if you drop the lore on people, that's the, you know, that's the world building, you know, mm. that is, you know, the lore is the world. And, um, I think there's a lot of takeaways from Ian's book. Um, I, I think, um, and I think there are a lot of takeaways from the tabletop RPG space as well that, that says that it's more than that. Yeah. Um, it's not just dropping a lore. When, um, uh, I, I think when you're, you're designing a tabletop role-playing game, the landscape is full of tabletop role playing games that nobody plays anymore. They don't, mm -hmm. you know, uh, or that never got played much without the active involvement of the designer that didn't, did not take on a life of their own in, in any way. And, yeah. and Ian's book is very much about that. You know, it, the, um, you know, he's got four creative aspects in his mental model of what he's doing as a creator, but he titles the book after one of them. And the yeah. one he titles it after is the one that's responsible for, for a world taking on a life of its own. Yeah. And in the tabletop space, I think uh, w what you realize is um, when you're creating a, a, a tabletop role-playing game, you worry about the um, the experience paradigm you're creating, how mm. people are going to engage with that world. Yes. So I, um, I mean, if we're talking about, uh, like, like Lost, for instance, I don't know, are you familiar with Lost? The TV um, show. Yeah. Um, yeah. Lost succeeded at taking on a life of its own. Uh, but it feels like a largely unintentional success. You know, the, mm. the writers were having fun dropping Easter eggs into things without really being quite sure where it was going to go. And, you know, that connected with, you know, an aspect of human thinking, you know, within the audience of finding patterns, trying to solve puzzles and, uh, and, and it, you know, it created its, um, uh, you know, it created a lot of user experience beyond, um, mm. you know, it, this experience paradigm was sort of unintentional, but, you know, emerged. Yeah. 
So then, so I guess like one of the questions then is dropping the law on people is somewhat is, is in, the, in that case is a bit more like setting rather than the world. Um, and one of the, one of the thoughts that I've been, or one of the things that I've been thinking about is, uh, is that the world exists between the material, the creator and either the player or the audience. In, I mean, if like in terms of Star Wars, for example, like the, the world exists between the, the movie and the audience plus plus the, the franchise owner. Um, and, in, and it's that interaction between the audience or the players. I'm trying to keep this a little bit more general than just being like, you know, the players of the game because worlds right, right, exist right. in so many different places. Which is why I brought like, up Lost because I yeah, think... Well, yeah, exactly. Know. That's what made me think about it because, yeah, like the, the world existing between those things and you feel it sometimes when you play when you play a when you play an rpg right like when everybody is in the world and sometimes those experiences that you have with with the other players that you're sitting around the table with feel more real <laughs> than or the memories of that experience feel more real than whatever it was that you you know that you were actually doing like i don't remember sitting around a kitchen table i remember being in a dungeon <laughs> <laughs> yeah in that case like i mean one of the things that you were saying about how lost sort of inspired people like you you've said in a pre i think i think it was something i read but you said it, your job as a game designer is to inspire people to, to play your game yeah um you know there's there's something um vincent baker said that um uh, you know, the game that you create is, <clears throat> it's competing with anything else that somebody could choose to be doing. It's not just competing with other role-playing games. It's competing with, you know, watching Avengers Endgame. You know, it's, um, so as a designer, you, um, you know, you have to be thinking about how you're going to uh, you know, activate the the prospective player to make them. Tabletop role playing games take work. I mean, they're not. You know, you're not just on the couch. You know, yeah. watching. You know, whatever. You know, you're not just watching Star Wars. You know. Yeah. And uh, and I think there are. You know, there are a lot of. Um, there are a lot of tools, you know, uh, associated with, you know, it, I don't think anybody's figured it out perfectly. Um, uh, like, like with the clay that walk, which is a game that I published in 2014, it has its world. Uh, it's a, it's a declining civilization. The player characters are minotaurs. And uh, they're an underclass in this society that's declining. And there's a, uh, there's a species of trees called the Watchers that have no leaves. Um, and it's said that if society in the shadow of the trees is going to ever achieve another era of greatness, then the trees will uh, recognize that and they will frondess and they will bloom. And, uh, and like I was saying, there's so many games out there that nobody plays. And when I was thinking about it, I'm thinking, how do I install this game in the mind of the prospective player to where they feel like they have to play it, like they want mm. to play it and like they're going to do the work necessary to play it. Yeah. And I, I think, um, uh, you know, no, nobody has really figured out a solution to that, but I felt like if I wrote it like a traditional role-playing game text, that it would, uh, which is traditionally very much like a textbook. You know, you yeah. have a, yeah, yeah. a chapter of instructions for how to create a character, and then you have a chapter of instructions for 
how to resolve the actions that that character takes in the you know in the game world by using dice mechanics or whatever whatever else, you have a, yeah you have a section that's written kind of like a you know about the world that explains the culture and the you know the lore um you have a you have a section that talks about to the to the game master how to run the game and succeed and what kinds of situations to create what kinds of conflicts to create and it's very much an instructional text and with the clay that woke i i thought you know if if i write it like that and nobody plays it i'll be kicking myself afterwards so i want to try something different and what i did was i i wrote fiction and i had it entwined with the game text so you would learn a little bit about the game world in the fiction and then some in the text there would be instructions for creating the character but some things would not be fully explained and then you would read a chunk of fiction and you would get more of that and yeah. and my goal my goal was to you know instead of uh jumping around and reading bits and pieces you know i wanted the reader to to start at the beginning and get drawn through the full game text so that by you know by the time they get to the end of it it sort of felt like reading fiction but the whole game was installed in them yeah you know ready to go so it was kind of a question of like the way in which the player is onboarded into the world rather than just the game because it's the the route through and essentially there's a kind of a compression of information that you the way that the, the way that those the book is written um which means that if you've passed through that media you are now prepared you know everything you need to know <laughs> basically yes yeah which i mean i mean it is it's still even you just talking about it now is it still sounds really innovative you know <laughs> like i mean it must be hard though actually to to compress that amount of information into something because it can't be too long <laughs> otherwise yeah. people won't get to the end of it and if it's too short you might be missing out a key aspect of the feeling of the text that is required to onboard people can you talk about that a little bit like how you went through that process yeah that you're exactly right it's super hard you're you're constantly making little decisions um because if if you do want the game to take on a life of its own there you know there's you know there's kind of a handoff that that you're doing you're you're giving the recipient permission to use it you're trying to mm -hmm. activate them with energy and inspiration to use it and uh if you look back at a lot of the role playing games of the 90s they could be really intimidating because the publishing paradigm was this splat book thing where they were yeah. constantly coming out with new lore new canonical content and your ability to keep up with it, you know it was a, it was an avalanche of um and you could you, you would never get to the point where you felt confident like you you were ready to that you had ownership of it and that it was your world and you could take it and and do anything with it mm -hmm. and so you're so when i write a game setting like i did for the clay that woke and like i need to do for traverser yeah uh i need to give just enough that the that the recipient feels like they understand the world they understand its themes they understand what's on genre for it and what's not uh, and uh and they feel confident and they believe that they can that they can they can do it mm. and you're making lots of little decisions about what to include and what language to use that's going to be energizing and what language to use that what language not to use that's going to be that's going to create doubts that you don't want mm. to create so i'm wondering about that that focus on themes and rather than being like really prescriptive about what is the setting essentially you're arming people with with what the what the world should feel like when you're playing the game rather than being like you know this is all the details and here's a massive law book <laughs> yeah 
Yeah. And I guess, I guess one of the, one of the other questions that I actually haven't touched on with that many people, um, so far in this series is who loves the world. And it kind of feels like that's, that's what we've been speaking about a little bit in terms of my idea is who loves the world are the people that continually come back to a world that the, either the creator has stepped away or, you know, it's a, it, it's a, what does Ian say? He's, he says something like it's, it's not an infinite game, but it's infinite enough <laughs> that the drama uh -huh. is, uh, you know, the, the, the drama continues to unfold. And it's, and for me, people who love the world are people that continually come back to it, regardless of, of what the medium is. And I guess your, your intention as a game designer is obviously for people to play it and to keep playing, to keep playing it. But then again, it's also a game that, um, is unusual because it has the narrative it closes with the end of the narrative right it does the destination uh, is it what's the right is that the right term the narrative the end of it's a destination within the game because it's so um you know the 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 games of the 90s i mean the the way um the way designers talked about them, the way, you know, the hobby talked about them, uh, you know, they were a solved problem in a way, you know, there, there was, um, you know, they all had this, uh, what they called rule zero, which meant if the rules don't work for you, then change them to make them work for you, which yeah. in effect the, is the game designer absolving themselves of designing a experience paradigm that they really believe in yeah um and the um they i i think um you know as a, as a solved problem they also um uh they they treated play as something that you would do forever you know, you'd create these characters and, you know, the belief was that the players would want to inhabit that character and, you know, and play it forever, endlessly, yeah. you know, with, with no end. And so when I designed My Life with Master, I think one of the things I was saying is that you could treat the end of play as a creative destination and you can, um, uh, and there are things you can do collaboratively as you know a game group uh that are empowering and memorable and you know they're meaningful communication between uh you as participants about what's important in life and what um how the world works and um and those are you know you can make meaningful statements by by treating um, the end of play as a as a destination in the same way that a novel you know treats right. its end as a as a destination and I think um, uh, and and so um, so I would disagree when you say that you know um, uh, you know my goal would be to um, you know to make a world memorable you know like uh, you know like Ian says um, I think a world can be memorable in retrospect. You can be done with it, and yet it's still in your head, and it's still installed on in you, and it made mm -hmm. a difference to you in the same way that Superboy comics made a difference <laughs> to me when I was a kid, because he always solved his problems by being clever, not by, you know by being stronger. Mm -hmm. And um, and even though I haven't read a super you know a Superboy comic in you know you know since I was a kid. Um, there, you know, the world is there because, and the world w worked a certain way and it's in me, you know, as mm. a, um, and I think, so I think gameplay experiences that come to an end, uh, y you know, we remember them fondly, you know, yeah. like we remember our favorite movies and they're, you know, uh, that, you know, that world is still out there living you know it's still a game that i might recommend to somebody or a movie i might recommend to somebody it's mm. um you know it has its own life 
So I think you you don't need to be in the world in the, like the way that you're seeing it is is that the, the, the world you don't need to be in in the world for the world to continue to live if the world is in you as a the audience or the player and then you take that away with you that that's also a success from the point of view of of worlding the world let's say i i think so mm. i think shakespeare succeeded at world building mm -hmm. um What, what then is the difference between narrative? So with narrative play as a destination as a, and it's kind of like a complete world. Um, what's the difference for you between the end of a world and what is at a world's edge? Because I kind of feel like when you're when you're inside a world, whether it's tabletop world or an online world or whatever, there is, the, I mean, even Minecraft has an edge <laughs> right and yeah but so does so do so do rpgs in a way because like it's either a, a thematic edge like you were saying earlier where you're like oh this doesn't actually feel like it fits the game you know whatever it is that you're doing at you're pushing right. against the boundary um and yeah i mean how do you kind of conceptualize those differences between like the like the end the beginning the end and then there's like the, the edges of a, of a world Either as a designer or as a player, I guess. Yeah, I, um, I, I think that's one of the hardest things to do as a as a designer is to, um, is to teach people what your genre is. You know what your themes are. A game like the Clay That Woke, yeah, you know, it has elements of uh surrealism and you know phantasmagoria and um and of class struggle and um and uh emotional yearning and you know feeling uh like you can't say things because of social pressures that mm -hmm. you wish you could say and uh and yet there, you know, there are no car chases or, um, and, and figuring out how to convey the genre is super hard. It's not a solved problem. It's a tricky, artful guesswork and trial and error. How do you, the, how do you feel about mechanics? within that within that same kind of question right so you've got all of these thematic edges but then there's the mechanics which i are either i kind of see mechanics as either edges or bounding boxes that say that nothing can happen outside of this particular you know these particular I... mechanisms or the other way around is that they're a generative thing that's like, you know, you roll against the table or you pull out a card and it tells you what to do sort of thing. Um, and those things are kind of generative mechanics because that's like an, in, like a mechanic is almost an inside edge of the world. Right. Um, I, I think mechanics are fundamental. Um, I think, um, I mean, you can find in the tabletop space, you can find designers who've created worlds that are entirely lore without really worrying too much about mechanics. Uh, Tecumel is, is one of those. It was created by M.A.R. Barker. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it did succeed in taking on a life of its own. It's had multiple mechanical systems attached to it over the years. When, when Barker would run it himself, he didn't use any of those systems. He would just say to a player, uh, well, tell me what you want to do, and then roll the dice. And if you roll high enough, I'll tell you if you succeed or not. And it was a very sort of on-the-fly um, mechanic, and he didn't care about it. But I think jazz. as a... <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I think that if you are a tabletop game designer and you are not trying to use mechanics to help create the energy of your game world and to help it take on a life of its own and to say something about how that world works and what's important in life and uh, 
I, I think you are leaving a lot of your tools off the table if you want to succeed at getting your world to take on a life of its own. I think mechanics are, are fundamental. I think you can succeed um, with just mechanics in, in a lot of ways. I, if you, um, like if you look at, at uh, Dungeons and Dragons third edition, they, they created their open game license and, uh, and as a result of that, they gave permission to a lot of people to, to have a certain experience paradigm relative to the game. Yeah. And, uh, and what that, they gave permission to people to be creators in, in certain ways. And, and the, um, and what a lot of those creators did, if, and you can see it now, is, is they created uh, the OGL. I'm sorry, the OSR. Yeah. The, um, the, you know, their idea of what old school Dungeons and Dragons was, and they're creating zines, and they're creating game hacks, and it's, that's largely, it. and so Dungeons and Dragons has taken on a life of its own beyond the creator, and yet it's done it largely mechanically with an, yeah. you know, with an experience paradigm. There's not a lot of lore attached to that. That's essential. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's the play paradigms, the mechanical paradigms. I think, uh, I think mechanics are a fundamental tool to a tabletop game designer. When, when I designed my life with master, um, I published it at Gen Con, people played it and, um, and I, rem I distinctly remember one time a group of players talking with each other after playing it and enthusing about, you know, what each other had done, you know, in the game. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was great when you did that. Or it was, you know, oh, it was, you know, that was awesome. It was such a great suggestion. And they were, um, they, they felt, you know, activated in a way. And they felt excellent, like they had been excellent with each other. And they had been. Mm -hmm. But... If you think about, you know, that game experience in, in, you know, relative to other game experiences that they've had, um, you know, at some point they have to acknowledge that it wasn't just their own raw creativity that they brought to the table because they could have done that in another game and they could have done that in another game. But this game was special and it was unique to them under, you know, under these circumstances. This group mm -hmm. of people, you know, at this time, the mechanics activated them creatively in the same way that, you know, a lot of writers will use, you know, creative prompts or, you know, uh, I think William S. Burroughs had this cut up method where he would chop up bits of a text to, yeah. to inspire him. I think as a, as a game designer, you have the opportunity to activate people with your mechanics. And if, and if you only conceptualize what you're doing as dropping the lore, not that, you know, then you're leaving, a, you're leaving important tools off the table. You could succeed with just mechanics. You've previously said about how a lot of um, game, RPG games are like driven by conflict as a mechanic rather than cooperation. Um, I mean, and, and in certain ways, I mean, Dungeons and Dragons, in terms of its core mechanics, is just dispute resolution <laughs> of one kind yeah. or another, right? Um, I was wondering about, like, because I know this is a theme in Traversa as well, if you could speak a little bit about that kind of like, because I, I think it's something that you believe quite deeply that, that games should do more than just resolve conflict. Yeah. Um... So it, and it was working on Traverser that made me realize this. Um, so Traverser is my, um, uh, this was a game that I didn't think that I was going to create. Um, I, uh, I had created uh, The Clay That Woke. It had, um, you know, it has themes of, you know, masculinity and, you know, and the responsibilities of the individual within society. And I told myself, and the player characters are all male minotaurs. And I told myself, you know, somebody else is going to look at it and say, well, how about a game about all women? And, 
and I said, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to do that. Somebody else will do that. Well, I, you know, I kept thinking about it and thinking about it. And, and I ended up coming up with Traverser, which is a, I, you know, I think of it as a companion game. Mm. The player characters are women. They're ex soldiers. And it's a, uh, it's in a future where, uh, reality tore itself apart and stitched itself back together. And it's, and it's a different reality. It's like if human society got a second chance, we would organize ourselves differently. So there are no prisons. Um, and uh, there, uh, there is no fossil fuel industry and, uh, and there is no global currency market. And, um, and as I was writing it, that's how I ended up discovering solar punk because that, you know, I, you know, I was envisioning what, what would this world look like if it was a better world? So what I wanted to do was put the player characters into it. They think like us. They're from our world. They're ex-military. They think about justice the way we do. They think about money the way we do. They think about crime the way we do. And if I put them in a better world, um, how do they, um, how do they become who they want to be? So the, mm -hmm. so the clay that woke is about, um, do individual actions add up to creating a better world is, you know, are the trees going to, are the watchers going to front us and bloom again based on the collective judgment of the player group about whether the, um, about the individual actions of the player characters. And mm -hmm. will, will there be a better world in the future? And this is the reverse of that. This is, if you put yourself, if, if you put someone who thinks like us about the world, who has our biases in a better world, how do they figure out who they wanna be? So, right, so you, I'm sorry, you asked about uh, the resolution mechanics. And, yeah. and I started off- versus um, and I started off with Traverser uh, with a conflict resolution system. I was trying to make it as a hack of Apocalypse World, which is a Vincent Baker game. It's another one that succeeded at its own worlding and taking on a life far beyond, you know, just Vincent's active involvement. Um, but when I ran play tests, I realized that conflict resolution was not right for the world it wasn't right for the game it didn't feel right mm. and and that's what you know and i realized you know almost all role-playing games have conflict resolution as a as a central you know we, we've internalized this thing we've internalized it from screenwriters we've internalized it from the from the film industry that scenes are about conflict and that's where a story gets its energy by resolving conflict. Yeah. And, and what I figured out with, go ahead. I was just going to say, do you think that that is something also to do with the, with the, with the, with the war games, historical influence on the development of RPGs, right? Because I kind of see it like in John, um, in, uh, what's his name? Uh, it's in the other room. Uh, John Peterson's playing John, the world. John Peterson's book, yeah. Yeah, where he talks about war games, and then there's the simulation as a separate kind of like s set of concerns that the, all of the people had. So, do you think is it is it just the war games influence? Because a simulation is is something different from conflict re resolution. You know, there's like in your case, right? Just, um, cooperation mechanics is a simula is a, is is like the simulation element of that. Kind of so, thing, right? um, so I think role-playing games would have gone down that path anyway, even anyway. independent of, of the war game history. And I think, you know, the evidence of that is when you look at, you know, books on screenwriting that tell you, mm -hmm. you know, make it revolve around conflict, you know? Um, so, um, so I think it would have gone down that path regardless of where it started historically. I, I would call um, the mechanic. I'll, I'll describe the mechanics in uh, Traverser to you. I would call them not a cooperation mechanic, but an agreement mechanic. And 
uh, and and so w what you have in the game is uh, the characters have abilities that they can use. And uh, you can do all sorts of things, but when you do one of these things that's described on the list of abilities, then you have to use the resolution mechanics. And, uh, and they range from things like kill someone to other things that you wouldn't find in another role-playing game, but which I think are important and fundamental um yeah and all and also things that are hard for people to do like uh fall in love with someone or create a work of art that's personally meaningful to you um you teach someone to fight uh so there's uh i think there's 19 of them and uh and the way you resolve it and, and there's a list of possible outcomes that range from uh, for each one of them that, uh, you know, maybe your insecurities are activated, you know, you fall in love with someone, but your insecurities are activated and you do something cruel to them in response, or you, um, uh, you fall in love with someone and you change your mind about something that you believe as a result of that. Mm. Um, and, and so we're playing along, you and I are playing a game and we get to a situation and you decide, hey, I think I want to fall in love with her, or I want to fall in love with him. And then we'll use the resolution mechanics. And I've got a, um, I'm looking at the same list you are, and I've got a card, and you've got, I've got a set of cards, and you've got a set of cards. And based on my assessment of everything that's led up to this situation, what do I think is going to happen? Which of these outcomes is the likely outcome? And you're, um, and you're doing the same thing. And then we compare our cards at the same time. And if we agree, then that's what happens. Mm -hmm. And it is unlike any other role-playing game because it's not about conflict. It's about agreement. And you and I at that point, I mean, the first time we did it, it was like you feel an emotional connection to the other player. Right. Yeah. It's like we were, we are totally on the same page about this. And uh, yet there are strategic game elements to it as well because um, if we disagree, then you get to pick whatever you want to have happen from the remaining outcomes. So if you think we're not on the same page, you know, we're a group of players and we've been communicating, we've been thinking about all this stuff together. And if you think I may not be on the same page as he is, uh, then you can play off. I'm going to mm -hmm. pick this one so that maybe we don't match. And, um, and then I can pick from the non-matched outcomes, the, the one that I really want to have happen. Right. So there are strategic concerns as well as this sort of emotional connection. And um, it's one of the reasons that it's, um, I mean, it's like nothing else. And it's uh, why I really want to get back to finishing it. So is that, so would you say that that, that, that um, so as a cooperation mechanic, I've, I've often wondered about like coordination in general within kind of RPG games. Um, and by that, I mean, where, where, where it is like a collective agreement about what happens and the way that people can coordinate, like whether it's voting with uh, counters or tokens or, or whatever it is, you know? Um, and I guess, I guess the, 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 one of the things that comes to mind is kind of like this structured way of collaborating with people that, that there is a certain set of rules, um, or mechanics, um, that are everyone that are agreed upon that allows us to generate stories or narrative moments, I guess, that are either, um, that are either something that we both agree upon, which are going to be like mutually beneficial, or even if you do kind of like you were saying about gamifying it, it's going to create a, it still creates a moment of drama <laughs> regardless. And so what you're actually doing in, in, in this sense is that all mechanics are in service of furthering the narrative and collaboration between players. Is that right? Yes. Hmm. Um, I, um, you know, I think it's one of the things that, um, that a tabletop game designer does is, um, 
I mean, like a good one, I think, um, is you're thinking about, um, uh, what's important in life, you know, you want, you know, uh, what's important enough to spend your time saying, you know, through a, mm -hmm. a, a role playing game, but you're also thinking about things like how human beings connect with each other and how we collaborate and how we arrive at collective decisions and, um, and you're making that part of the play paradigm, you know, make it part yeah. of the engagement paradigm. If, um, you know, the world is full of, uh, you know, corporate techniques for, um, generating ideas, brainstorming sessions and chip voting and, uh, uh, and, uh, and I think there's so much more than that. There are so many more ways that uh, creativity works than than just how uh, corporate consultants think that it works. And one of the ways you make your game engaging is by having something to say about creativity and human connection. You know, in the in the play paradigm. And I, and I think this is, you know, I mean, I think this comes straight back to your, you know, you know, what does the, the world runner do? Um, I think, you know, it's not just about dropping the lore. It's, mm. um, it's the engagement paradigm that you foster the, you know, the permission yeah. you give the actions that, um, you f you foster for the um the audience or the players the players with in that case what sort of responsibilities do you think a world runner should have or or at least um because obviously a game designer has responsibilities towards the player and their and and in a sense towards the the way that the world unfolds once the world is has been set in motion as a designer but a world runner f is someone that has that kind of ongoing engagement with the world that you know is always trying to like not necessarily control it but at least nudge it <laughs> in order for it to continue you know rolling down the mountain as it were but i'm thinking p particularly around like i mean we've just been talking about emotional and emotional narratives and, and, and like allowing players to be on it, the same page emotionally, but what sort of res responsibilities do you think a world runner should have? Wow. That, I mean, that's a, a huge question and, you know, um, well, how do we even think, go about thinking about what sort of responsibilities right. a world runner has? So the world runner is going to be between two um, stakeholders, I guess. The um, you know, you know, I can envision, yeah. You know, uh, like I just saw an article about um, the Marvel, uh, the Marvel films, and how they use a three D modeling tool to basically pre-film the the films and mm. and create the frames just the way they want them so that uh the characters are arranged in certain ways and you know the flow of action is a certain way um and they'll, they'll do a whole film that way using 3d video software to to do it and uh and they're exerting a certain control over how the you, you know, what's delivered to the, to the audience. Mm. Um, you know, I'm sure, you know, and, uh, you know, Disney's the same way, you know, they don't want a ton of Mickey Mouse, um, knockoffs out there, you know, they, they want, you know, so, um, so, a, you know, a world runner in a, you know, in a media context is in this position of, how do they um, uh, how do they mean control over the um, property you know over the you know over the world and 
uh, and how do they create, you know, and what kinds of freedoms and, you know, what kinds of uh, uh, engagements do they, do they foster in the, in the audience or, you know, mm. in, in the players? Uh, you know, if, if you, um, if you look at the, we were talking about Dungeons and Dragons third edition, the, you know, the thing that made the OGL, you know, the OSR possible was the OGL license that they created in third edition. And what they were trying to do is they were trying to do something very corporate. Uh, they had looked at their finances and they realized uh, the most profitable product they had was the player's handbook yeah. because everybody who played the game needed one. Uh, and then they had books like the Dungeon Master's Guide and the Monsters Man, you know, the Monster Manuals, which yeah. only one member of a group really needed a copy of those in order to 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 do the game. And then they looked at publications like Adventure Modules and not even every group needed each individual adventure module. They only needed, so, so they looked at these modules and they thought, these are not really profitable for us. We need them to exist in order to sustain the, um, the product, but we're, you know, we spend a lot of money creating them and they're not as profitable for us as the player's handbook. So they, so, I think what's clear from reading people like Ryan Dancy, who was the the one at uh, Wizards of the Coast at the time, who who pushed forward the the OGL, that what they wanted to accomplish was they wanted third parties to use the OGL to create um, module type content. You know, they looked out on the internet, they saw people were doing that already. You know, game masters were, were already creating this kind of stuff. And they had an expectation that that's what people would create. But what really happened was the first thing any of the third party publishers did was create monster manuals. Because the monsters are easy to create. They had a structured stat block. They could do it as a hardcover book. They could put core book on it. And, you know, it would feel, you know, it, it was a step up the must have from mm -hmm. modules. To the, to the monster manual. And uh, so there were unintent, you know, as you try to create this experience paradigm that you want, you know, the engagement paradigm that you want people to have, you make all kinds of mistakes. Mm -hmm. And well, I mean, not necessarily a mistake, but you have unintended, you know, effects. I, I think, um, you know, that would be a huge amount of pressure on a world runner. How do I you know, how do I maintain my responsibility to corporate ownership of, of the property? At the same time, you know, how do I succeed at creating something like the audience response that you get to Lost or to WandaVision or to Game of Thrones? Um, the, you know, uh, hobby response that you got to the... Uh, d d third edition, OGL, you know, how do you create that stuff without losing control? Mm. And I, I think, like, for instance, you know, Shakespeare's dead, he's lost full control. The, you know, all of the, um, you know, the Shakespeare's world exists, he's embodied in that world, and we still have a relationship with him, mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, it's, on and on, you know, um, but how do you, you know, in a corporate context, how do you not lose, you know, lose control and have it just, you know, individual artists maybe don't care. Shakespeare probably yeah. would not have cared very, very much at all. Um, and do you, th well, uh, do you think in that case, um, it just com comes to mind, do you think that a successful world maintains its its sense of coherence in terms of like when you're talking about losing control in a corporate sense, but like that the, the, a world maintains its coherence regardless of um, either how many people are using it or, or you know, how, however many people are in the world, let's say. Um, and that the way it's constructed allows it to stay, to have that kind of coherence. That's a, that's a tricky question 
Um, because if the mechanics of D and D are a world in in of themselves, like I'm also thinking about all the hacks on lasers and feelings. Um, yeah, like that whole rule set, like that that's a whole world in itself. You know, like that whole once you know the rule set, you can you know read your two page a uh, two page PDF and then off you go and play the game. And those feel quite coherent if they're written tightly enough. Again, thematically, like we we said earlier. So, um, so Avery Alder's game, Monster Hearts. Um, I think you said you played it at one point. Yeah. Um, I think that's a success at uh, worlding, um, mm -hmm. because what it did was it it created uh, an audience, a, a player base for a certain kind of relationship drama gaming. Yeah. And and if you look yeah. at the landscape of so it's a it's a hack of apocalypse world. It's a powered by the apocalypse game. And if you look at the landscape of other powered by the apocalypse games, th they partake of that relation that certain kind of relationship drama um interplayer relationship drama in a certain way. Uh, you know, almost unconsciously, you know, almost mm -hmm. like, you know, um, so I think, uh, but I think that's hard to do. I think it yeah. is, you know, I think it's hard for a world to stay coherent without the active involvement of the creator. It, I think it's easy for it to become craziness, you know? Yeah. Like spir just spiraling. I mean, I, I don't know if um, I might. I'll send you the link. But there's this documentary about the um, Minecraft server that that has like no rules, and it's the oldest Minecraft server, and it's where all four chan four chan hang out. So it's just like just an apocalypse wasteland of like littered craziness. It's fantastic. It's like a two hour documentary about the history of it, and it's amazing. But yeah, you're right. Like the world itself is still there, but it's not coherent in in any in any sense. And I think the evidence of that is stuff like Ultima Online, mm -hmm. who you know, um, where if they did not have active world management, the the thing would have been a hellscape. You know, they yeah. Um, yeah, World of Warcraft was pretty bad around the time of Burning Crusade as well before they had better community management <laughs> yeah i mean i guess that's a question actually is like how much ongoing i mean as just as a, as a general question as you as a designer how much ongoing discussions do you have with players that are playing that are still playing your games do people contact you and say oh this happened the other day it was an un unexpected you know so that, so that's an interesting question um I um, I saw M A R Barker talk about uh, about this at a game convention when I was a kid. Uh, he's the one that created Tecamel, and uh, he would get letters from people, mm -hmm. and they would say, "Oh, you know, we're our game is set in this location, and this just happened. This particular prince was deposed, or whatever." And he would take that and he would in, include it in his journal that he published. He would, you know, he would take, um, I get, um, I get rules questions, mm. you know, from people who are playing it, you know, how would you do this? Or, you know, am I thinking about this right? Or what does this mean? Um, I, uh, I think, you know, I, I really, I really loved uh, Emissary's Guide to Worlding. I think, I mean, I think it's a fantastic book. I think yeah. it, um, and uh, and like I said, you know, he he named it the Emissary's Guide because he recognized that uh, what he was saying with the emissary aspect was different than you know other uh, you know mental models for creativity. We're saying, and you know, he was he was 
a lot of creators would say, well, I'm going to write the book, I'm going to put it out there. And there's a whole external system that's out there responsible for marketing it, trying to create some engagement, you know, and it's going to either succeed or not based on its merits and based on this external system of, and you know, what, what he's saying is take that activity of, you know, the responsibility for a world taking on a life of its own beyond you as the creator and make that a part of your mental model for, for how, you know, for who you are as a creator. It's, it's mm. it is, you know, it is an equal participant mentally in what you're doing is the, is the actions you take that help your world take on a life of its own. Um, and so, you know, for me as a creator, um, you know, I, I want to be the blind watchmaker. I want, you know, um, I want to spin it up and have it take on a life of its own without my mm -hmm. active involvement. There is a landscape of role-playing games out there, um, and there always has been, where, you know, they're kind of well-known locally. You know, maybe the designer runs it at a local game convention or a couple of local conventions, and people sign up to play the game and the game only exists due to the ongoing active involvement of, of the designer. Yeah. And the reason Ian's book really clicked for me is because all of the things he talks about um, with the emissary, you know, the emissary aspect is stuff that I want to achieve as a, as a designer. I want, mm. you know, the clay that woke is an embodiment of me as a creator you know, who I was at the time that I created it. Yeah. And I, wa I want it to have a life of its own. And do you think that people who step into that, to play that game and step into that world are in, are in some sense then experiencing who you were at that point in time as a creator then? I, I think so. I think, hmm. you know, I think artists are embodied in, in what they create, you know, Shakespeare's embodied in, in what he created and, uh, and he, you know, you're having an, uh, you're having a communication with him, you know, yeah. um, when you read the play, when you see the play, when you see some post, you know, some contemporary reimagination of the play, you know, when you conceive of your own contemporary reimagination of the play, when you see, you know, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, there, you know, there is an ongoing relationship with him. I think yeah. Elvis Presley is a successful world builder. I, <laughs> I think yeah. Yeah. every Elvis impersonator is an embodiment of Elvis as a successful world builder. That's amazing. Like my brain has just, just exploded because, and one of the reasons is, is because I'm, I just finished reading this book. I've got my pile of reading on my desk, but I just finished reading this. It's called from dream, uh, from dreamer to dream finder. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. The guy called, you know, Bob I Schneider. think you linked me to that after yeah. So he's he he was a he was the the actor that played the character of the Dreamfinder in Disney World, and he's like a super famous Disney character that no one's ever heard of, basically, <laughs> unless you were in unless you were local to Disney World or whatever it is, the, the one with the um, Epcot Studios, basically. Unless you were like local yeah. to that, like you don't really ne know anything about the Dreamfinder, but if you were, then he was really important, <laughs> and. Um, but the whole book goes through um, it goes through his history with dinner theater and create what it's like to create dinner theater for people to come in and sit down and eat dinner and how you need to get the pacing. The pacing of the narrative has to be the same as the pacing of the, the food <laughs> that's being cooked because yeah. it's coming out. Um, and although he doesn't mention it in here, it really ma makes me want to go see the Dolly Parton thing in America, like that she's got like a... the Right, Dolly... Dollywood? Is it called Dollywood? Uh, no, called Dollywood. she's got like a, she's got three of them and they're like, it's got a full, it's got like a hundred horses and you all sit there and eat dinner and and you watch this ring and it's like about the north, south, 
um, Civil War. And yeah, it's, it looks, and all the songs are by, by Dolly Parton. It looks crazy, but it looks amazing because it's like- didn't After the it. pandemic, you're going to have to do a research tour. Yeah, exactly. But one of the things that he says that, that this book is worth it just for the appendix. But one of the things that he says in the appendix about every, El like you were say saying about Elvis impersonators, but he says the best po possible celebrity impersonator um, has got nothing to do with casting a, with, with someone that looks like the character. And that, um, you know, you might have people coming in who look exactly like it, but basically you need to have knowledge and performance accuracy. Like if it was a triangle, you, you prefer those, the knowledge of the character and the accuracy of reproducing the feeling of the person rather than looking like them. Like that's the actual, that's the third yeah. concern. Um, but yeah, there's like how people can play Groucho Marx, for example. And you don't need to look anything like Groucho Marx as long as you're, you know, you've got the, got it all going on. You would yeah. Know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's really fascinating, actually. Like, um, it, it really spins, spins my head in interesting places when you're talking about Elvis as a successful world builder. But also, I guess the other side of that is that the media entity that created Elvis were also participants in that world building in order for him to be such a huge, huge icon that he is today. I think that's true, yeah. Like the edge of the world is not created by decisions of Elvis. The edge of the world is is the decisions of the of the media industry. Which which brings up an interesting question, you know, um, like uh, you know, like we were talking about Lost. You know, the the activities of the audience. Con, you know the conjectures you know of what the yeah. clues could possibly mean were consumed by the writing team and mm -hmm. and and so how much of world building is you know the you know a delivered you know a delivered thing from a creator or a creative team and how much of it is the participation paradigm itself the, yeah. you know, with Elvis, the media was part of that participation paradigm of creating, you know, Elvis's sandwich recipes and, you know, uh, yeah. all sorts of, yeah. 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 So the, the world does exist between the audience and the, and the creator, but like in, but also the media is a different kind of audience. That's also one of like an audience that is like a constructive audience, I guess. I mean, I, I get, I, I mean, I don't want to fall into this kind of semantics about like different types of audiences or different types of players, but they, I mean, they do exist obviously yeah, like active and passive, but um, one of the things that we, I was talking about with Alex Federa when we were talking about improv on stage is about the trust that you have to have both as a actor on stage you trust the audience <laughs> are going to be following what you're doing. You're, you're also trusting the other actors um, on stage that you're going to keep the world going and it's going to be coherent within the bounds of the, you know, the improvise, the, the, the three hours that you're improvising. And then the last thing is that the audience is trusting you <laughs> to, to yeah. lead them on the journey. And I'm, I'm actually just wondering about like, do you think that exists in, in terms of like, rpg design rather than the person that's running the oops obviously like because usually these conflicts or questions usually arrive arise around the person that's running the game you know whether it's the gm or the dm and what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable within the people around the table but as a but as a game designer do you think that players should trust you and you also are trusting the players to to i don't know you know the spirit of the world that you're trying to create in i don't know of, of... trust is definitely um an an interesting topic i think um uh i i can tell you um uh you know, I think it's I think it's fundamental to um, to to getting anybody to play your game. 
is you have to figure out how um, how to make them trust themselves and and to see that you know you trust them. You know, you say what you can say. You know, with your game text or with your you know uh, you know any other ways that you have to communicate with them, whether that's video or you know, I mean, not a lot of tabletop game designers use video or audio or anything but you could um yeah but at some point you know you have to they have to believe that you trust them to um there's in the clay that woke you know i you know i pretty much say there's a i i, I think i pretty much say it you know you can do this you know i, I you know i believe in you you're gonna have a great time you know i think mm -hmm. um and uh you know, trust is a very empowering thing. And, uh, and it's also a, a real block for people. There's a phrase that some people use in tabletop called history panic. And, uh, and it's used, you know, relative to games that are set in historical circumstances and uh, where the players don't feel like they understand enough of the historical context to even be able to play their characters well. Right. Um, uh, you know, what is the day-to-day -day life of, you know, uh, you know, the moment-to-moment the -moment actions of somebody, you know, during trench warfare in World War One. You know, how <laughs> yeah. do I, yeah, you know, what, how do I even play this character with confidence? Um, th there's a there's a role-playing game that was published in the. Um, in the nineties called Earth Dawn. <laughs> and uh, the, um, it had its lore. I mean, it had its own world history and everything. And I, you know, the creators, I think, I think it's clear that the creators recognized that <laughs> they needed to figure out a way to teach the world to the prospective players so that they could play their characters with confidence because it was mm -hmm. a, it was a fantasy, but it was a post-apocalyptic fantasy where the um, there were these horrific entities that had destroyed humanity, and humanity was just now emerging, and there was a lot of fear, and there were certain things you didn't do because they were would be perceived as threats, and you needed to learn all that stuff to be able to play your character with confidence. And their effort was to hire a writer named Christopher Kubasik to write a a trilogy of novels set okay. in the world. And uh, and I think what they were hoping was that players would read the novels, they would understand the world, and then they would feel like they could play with, with confidence. But I, I don't think that happened. Game Masters maybe read the novels. Not a lot of players read the novels. And it, you know, it was not, it's one of the reasons I wrote The Clay That Woke the way I did with the fiction wound yeah, through the game. Yeah, wound through it. Because the onboarding is so efficient in that in that sense, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm wondering about. I mean, we're, we're coming up on time, but I'm I'm re I'm wondering about that actually in terms of like, do you think it's do you think it's better if the players that are involved in a world are generating the world around them through a set of mechanics so yes there's a th there's themes and so on and so forth which are kind of maybe guide rails or provide that that coherence at the edges to keep people contained within the world but do you think that 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 worlds are more successful when they are gen well i mean as as ian cheng's book says they generate drama right like for the for it to, to continue so i've i've done it both ways um my life with master um has a, a, you know, before you play, the play group sits down and they create the antagonist together. And they have, and there's a structure, you have to make certain decisions. Um, but it's, but the player characters are basically like minions to Dracula or minions to, you know, um, some, you know, horrific, you know, I think uh, Miss Havisham in Great <laughs> Expectations, for instance, is, a, is an example. Um, uh, or uh, um, what's the movie about the Marquis de Sade where uh, um, with, uh, uh, geez, um, no, I can't remember it. I think it was, it was called Quills. 
Um, I have not seen that. Um, but. but anyway, you know, the Marquis de Sade would be, you know, so mm -hmm. you have to make certain decisions about the master and you're basically creating the setting at that point. You decide whether he's a brain, you know, he's got a mental focus or beast. He's got a physical focus. Um, you decide um, his wants and his needs. And, you know, you're basically creating your antagonist. And what it does is it creates a, a, an emotional investment on the part of the players with mm -hmm. um, that antagonist. They end up creating player characters who are going to be activated thematically by the antagonist that they created. Yeah. Um, I think, um, so I think it can, and, and whereas the clay that woke, um, your character creation is very quick for the players. They, they pick an archetype. There's four Minotaur archetypes, a soldier, a philosopher, an advocate, um, a leader, and that determines a starting set of tokens that they have. And that's pretty much it. Um, but it puts them in a it puts them in a specific world context, and the and the mechanics work a certain a certain way. So I think you know, I mean, going back to you know very much the earliest part of our conversation right now is as a game designer, you have a lot of tools at your disposal for creating engagement mm -hmm. and creating the antagonist together. Creating a world together is one of those tools, but um, giving someone a specific set of mechanics is another thing that activates the human brain in a certain way. Um, you know, in the same way that, you know, the human brain, you know, is, is so, um, you know, it's a pattern recognition machine. It's a problem solving machine. It's a, you know, it's going to look at game mechanics and it's going to try and figure out solutions to them. How should I use these? What can I accomplish with them? What can I, so, um, so I think, uh, or it's going to look at a game setting and it's going to try and say, you know, what's the, you know, what does this setting afford me as a player the opportunity to explore and say with the actions of my character, you know, mm. because that's what, that's what role-playing games are. They're a yeah. conversation among you and me and everybody else who's playing about life and, mm -hmm. you know, justice and uh uh how relationships work and what's a bad relationship and what's a good relationship and uh you know what's fair and unfair and you know um who gets a happy ending and who doesn't yeah and i and so i think use the tools to create the experience paradigm you know use the tools to to activate the engagement of the players. Mm. And I think, you know, the kind of engagement that Lost created accidentally is a different kind of engagement than, um, oh geez, you know, fan, fanfic writers, you know, writing Star Wars fanfic or... Um, yeah. it, it's, Do you um, think that it's because the feedback loop was important in that, in that, case or that example you know that the creators of lost were reading all of the stuff on the forums i think you know i mean lost to me is kind of a train wreck yeah, yeah. it's i it, mean it yeah it definitely is they it totally got away from them they could not tie up the loose ends you know they were writing from moment to moment yeah, they were doing the most dramatic thing there's a um there's a mechanic in in the early 2000s the indie role-playing game scene was coalesced around a website called the forge and uh there's a mechanic that got very popular called the monologue of victory and when you were playing in certain games that had this mechanic in them uh it it, it, it dates back to a role-playing game called the pool by a designer named james v west uh and when you would roll a success you had a you had a choice you could uh improve your effectiveness for going forward or you could describe you had the monologue of victory you got to describe what happened in the game you know historically in role-playing games in the solved problem role-playing games of the 90s the game master got to describe mm -hmm. but you know with this mechanic you got to describe 
And yeah. one of the downsides of this mechanic is you've put a player on the spot and you've given them full bore creative power and they have to come up with something. They're in a social context where they want to be interesting to the other players. And so they do something crazy. You know, they, they go off genre, you know, yeah. you know, you're doing a romantic comedy and suddenly there are zombies bursting in through the, you know, through the door, <laughs> through the, through the window. Yeah. Which is so the edge I, of the I world, think, right? Like you're hitting the edge of the yes. world in that sense. Yeah. And, and I think Lost sort of had that problem. You know, they, um, there was infinite input. There was full bore creative power on the part of the creative team. And it just went off the rails. They didn't have their own boundaries. They, you know, it was full on everybody rolling the monologue of victory, you know, yeah. every time. <laughs> <laughs> I think the monologue of victory is a really good place to end this, actually. Um, for those who are watching the video and have made it all the way to the end, where's the best place for them to find you on the internet? If they want to check out um, like so, social media wise, I'm most active on Twitter. I'm at Paul Sega. Um, my, my website where I sell my, uh, physical games is half And, uh, my website, which I treat as its own project of experimental game design <laughs> is I'm on, I'm at itch.io. Um, and you can find me if you search for, for Paul Sega on, uh, okay. itch.io. I'll put links in the show notes, um, to all of that stuff. Thank you very much, Paul. That's been a really interesting conversation. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks. It was great. And, cool. you know, we read the same books and it's, you know, it's hard not to have a good conversation after that. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much for coming on. Be well. Thanks for having me.